Um, hello, I'm Liam Gammon and this is New Mandala TV. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Political and Social Change at the ANU's College of Asia and Pacific. Uh, I'm joined here today by um, Greg Feely, who uh, researches Islamic politics and religious life uh, in uh, Indonesia. I'm with uh, Arianto Patunru, who is an economist at the ANU's Indonesia Project and a fellow um, political and social change PH can PhD candidate, Eve Warburton, who studies the politics of resource nationalism in Indonesia. Now, as we're recording this video, President Joko Widodo, or Jokowi, as we'll henceforth uh, refer to him, uh, is in Washington, DC, and he's about to uh, meet, have a dinner in his honor with uh, John Kerry. He's about to meet Barack Obama in the Oval Office and be fated by uh, US business leaders and uh, most importantly have dinner with the CEO of Apple. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, just a few years ago, if I'd have said the mayor of Solo uh, would be meeting with Barack Obama in the Oval Office, people would have looked, you, looked at you as if you were a bit crazy. Um, so you nevertheless, it's, it's, it's happened. Um, so in a sense, it's only been quite recently that we've really got a feeling for the kind of man that Jokowi is and the kind of political leader that he is. So I just want to open up this chat today by asking, what do you think is the most interesting or surprising thing that we've learned about Jokowi, the man, his character, uh, in his first 12 months? Something that we didn't, that wasn't revealed to us, uh, wasn't apparent before he became president. Well, if I start, it has been a meteoric rise, but in some ways, at least from, from where I stand, Jokowi has become a more enigmatic figure the higher he is risen. And when we hear some of the stories from the palace reported in the media and elsewhere about how his personal behaviour is changing, how he's becoming more formal and the like, uh, he is clearly a politician in the process of development. I think one of the things that surprised about the last year has been the lack of political fortitude that he's shown, particularly in facing down other powerful forces in his coalition. Uh, his willingness to compromise on matters that we previously thought were very dear to him, such as having reform-minded, economically rational people in the cabinet, people with strong track records, uh, most of those things were unexpected. And um, I, for one, am still not sure what the prospects are for Jokowi to improve his presidential performance in the remaining four years. Um, because in some ways he's slightly improved his position, in other ways I think um, we seem to have a fairly fixed pattern of him uh, not paying attention to a whole lot of reform issues, focusing on, focusing on economic issues, but most importantly of all, not doing anything to cause ructions within his cabinet. And that means that he has become a politician much like many of the people whom he's replaced. Essentially, it's business as usual. Is that the feeling for what the uh, next four years heralds? Uh, Largely it's that. There are some distinctive things uh, about Jokowi, the people he has around him, in some ways uh, the people whom he trusts most, in some ways are a different kind of person to the kind of people that SBY or, or Megawati would have had around them. But nonetheless, I think he is still far too concerned about political stability and he has no sense of brinksmanship about him. Mm. And really for him to have broken through the, those conventional boundaries of Indonesian politics to really put a distinctive stamp on his presidency, he needed to have an element of that taking on his enemies. And that would have seen, I think, an entirely different dynamic in politics now in Indonesia. But I suspect a great many of the coalition partners feel that they have his measure mm -hmm. and they know if they put pressure on him that he will, not, that he will yield. The, the the economy and the president's outlook on the economy is one of those areas where the evidence is so confounding and confusing. So I want to ask you, Pa Arianto, um, for the first, I suppose, nine or ten months or so of the administration, um, they came in for some very, very hairy criticism about interventionist and protectionist policies on trade, 
um, restricting the um, ability of expatriates to work in Indonesia, um, making uh, um, you know price controls and so on and so forth. Right. Um, yet in the last few months, we've got a real kind of change in tone in some areas. Um, the appointment of Thomas Lambong, uh, a real man of a real liberal persuasion as trade minister, mm -hmm. um, a change in rhetoric from the palace, which focuses upon uh, improving the business climate. And right. for the last few fortnights, uh, we've seen these sort of this drip feed of announcements of uh, cutting red tape in areas like taxation uh, and uh, business licensing and so on. So. Do you think that this change in tone is really anything substantial or is it really a, a matter of branding? Well, first of all, um, the uh, reshuffle was just over two months ago, right? So it's probably too early to judge the performance of the new ministers. But if uh, the remarks by, for example, uh, Minister Thomas Lembong uh, after his inauguration is of any indication, I think we have hope. And um, for example, he said that uh, we have to undo these protectionist measures because such measures actually backfires in the end. So I think that's a good sign. And um, these packages, as you know, the government has just launched five packages. Um, looking at the content, I think there are hopes, especially on the trade uh, front. Uh, for example, uh, there is a uh, clause to not require recommendation from Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Industry anymore for import of, say, sugar, mm -hmm. and not requiring a double check or survey from Survey Indonesia for something that is already checked in the customs. So mm -hmm. this, I think, is, is, is a good sign. But again, it's just two months. We, we, we never know. That it, I, I hope they will walk the talk, right? So, and also now that uh, the government, uh, President Jokowi himself is now in in, in US uh, to uh, persuade investors, if you like. I think it's a good sign. I mean, in the first year, people have been saying that actually Jokowi might not be very interested in international, uh, you know, uh, communities, but, uh, unlike uh, SBY, for example. But now he's trying to. At least we see the sign that he's trying to to be pragmatic uh, and to be more investor friendly if you like so yeah there's hope yeah um, I'd like to just ask uh, one issue that has really come to the fore during the first year of Jokowi's presidency is uh, trade in agricultural commodities right. and, and the idea of um, sort of uh, self-sufficiency or um, independence in food right. um, that has become a real kind of touchstone for a lot of nationalist politicians in Indonesia Jokowi yeah. himself has seemed keen on this so isn't it a bit of a contradiction to have a, um, this stated goal of food right. self-sufficiency, yet at the same time promising liberalization in, in trade? Yeah, contradiction is a good way to put it, I think. Mm. Um, so he has ministers, but not all of them uh, see eye to eye. So I, I, I don't think, well, I think Thomas Lembong, I hope uh, he, he will become a good, a better trade minister. But there is this minister of agriculture who keeps pushing on self-sufficiency and I think it's not the right time, it's not the right policy at the moment, especially for example, uh, sufficiency in all these commodities, rice, sugar, uh, soybean and others. And the fact that El Nino is coming, it's, it's going to make it far worse. And uh, saying that the, the stocks uh, are enough and we just know it's not enough because the, 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 the price keeps uh, increasing and if the price of this basic commodity increase, it actually hurts the poor. So I'm hoping that uh, Pak Darmin, for example, the coordinating minister can actually, you know, sort of navigate uh, these different views in the, in the cabinet towards a better outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just more broadly, do we think or do we have any idea if Jokowi himself has any kind of solid convictions on economic matters or is he simply going on the advice of people around him? Uh, that's a difficult question, uh, but I think he's, he's, well, first of all, he's a pragmatic. And, and, and I think at the end of the, at of the day, he will see that uh, the stock is not there. And uh, 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 for example, uh, fiscal space is also uh, not enough. So like the, 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 the events in the last few days, we can see that he actually understands what's, what, what was the problem. Mm -hmm. and. 
uh, what the problems are. And I think, uh, well, he seems like a very uh, good leader, but uh, unfortunately, he probably lacks of uh, macro narrative, uh, if you like. So uh, it probably takes some time. But the recent indications, I uh, think, uh, give us some 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 hope that he is actually learning that uh, things are not as good as he is been told by his, uh, for, example, for example, Minister of Agriculture. Mm. Um, Eve, you've been doing research on the political economy of the resources sector in Indonesia, which is uh, quite a mess of political <laughs> economy, <laughs> if there ever was one. So. Uh, Jokowi did actually come to office with uh, sort of a personal interest in reforming the mining sector and uh, uh, cleaning up some of the vested interests and, and rent seeking that occurs uh, in that industry. So uh, what went wrong? Because um, it's, it doesn't seem to have um, sort of taken place. Yes, yes, that's right. If we um, cast our minds back to the presidential campaign, Jokowi did indeed um, sort of sell this narrative that he was going to rid the sector, this very strategic sector of, um, of energy and mining, of, of vested interests. And in, in Indonesia, the, the term is the mafia. Um, and indeed, I think in the first few months, uh, there were really positive signs that he was committed to reform in this sector. And, and the, first, um, the first sign of, of, of progress was the appointment of Sudirman Said to the minister. Uh, for energy and mineral resources, and and prior to to Jokowi under SBY, we had this, we had political appointees, um, we had appointments of people who were widely seen as kind of uh, political operators uh, and corrupt indeed, uh, and so with the appointment of Sudirman Said, we for the first time in a long time uh, had um, a widely regarded as a clean minister, mm. a pragmatic minister, uh, lots of experience in the bureaucracy. Uh, so that was a really good sign. He also went ahead and appointed an independent uh, team to provide recommendations to him on how to clean up the oil and gas sector, which we, is notoriously corrupt, and particularly the importing uh, of oil into Indonesia. So those were really good signs. But then I think, and this is we see this uh, not just in this sector, but, but this contradiction um, and, and chaos, in fact, in, and erratic behaviour in, in uh, the way Jokowi approaches uh, policy and, and approaches reform. So on the one hand, he was uh, pointing to uh, progress, to reform. Uh, and on the other hand, at the same time, we see many cases where Jokowi has uh, bent to the pressure of vested business interests, uh, particularly within his own coalition. Um, and so just to, just to point to one case study in particular, you know, right at the same time as he appointed this independent team to look into corruption in oil and gas imports, he then gave the green light to Saudi Apollo the head of the National Democratic Party, one of his coalition partners, to go ahead and uh, and organise, facilitate um, an importing deal uh, with Angola through one of Saudi Apollo's own private business partners from China. Mm. Um, it was incredibly dubious, um, terrible optics. Uh, but again, this is this contradiction that that Jokowi, uh, you know, that that we can't. He's unpredictable in the way he approaches these reforms, and I think it says it speaks to perhaps his own lack of understanding and naivety of the way that these rents, the rent seeking works in the sector. But I think also it, it reflects a kind of superficial commitment uh, to transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many other cases we could, of course, point to as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a broader sense, and we look at some of the, the way he makes decisions that affects the interests of people around him, mm. is he well aware that he's being put under pressure by rent seekers and vested interests? Or is it a question of um, uh, he doesn't know um, a dodgy confidant when, when he sees one. What, what's our feeling on that? I think with the particular case that I just mentioned, I think that, uh, and we know this from other cases as well, sometimes Jokowi signs things that he doesn't read. Uh, <laughs> sometimes he doesn't do his research. Um, I think it did in that case demonstrate uh, perhaps there was a political deal made in advance. Uh, perhaps he just really didn't understand the nature of the deal and, and didn't know who this um, Chinese investor was or this broker was. But I think in other cases, and, and again, I would refer to the mining sector, Jokowi is aware that he is constantly managing the vested business interests of the elites around him. I mean, it's public knowledge that the, the Vice President Yusuf Kala has interest in the mining sector, uh, of course, Surya Palo, and then uh, indeed Luhut Panjaitan, his former Chief of Staff and now one of the coordinating ministers, has direct interests in the sector. And Jokowi is constantly trying to balance these interests, but he does a very poor job of it, and it has an effect on, on the direction of policy and on some of the the government's um, decisions on key strategic contracts with, with big 
uh, big foreign oil and gas and mining companies. And I think that um, to a large extent what we had hoped is that Jokowi would attempt to insulate his minister from these vested business and, and, and vested political interests. Um, and instead he's, he's hot and cold with, with his minister and often abandons him. And I think that um, that speaks to, I think, perhaps also what, what Greg mentioned in terms of his own personal character as well. Mm. Mm. I would just add to mm. that, Liam, that sometimes I think in the foreign media an impression is given that Jokowi is something of a, of a, a very purely, a, a very pure politician mm -hmm. and something of an ingenue. And I think one of the mysteries with him is that on the one hand, he does look as if he's out of his depth politically. Mm -hmm. And we've got the case that Eve mentioned about um, Suripalo and Sampo. But in other cases, we know from his time as governor of Jakarta and mayor of Solo, that he was quite prepared to do political deals. And mm -hmm. what's more, he was quite prepared, prepared to use sensitive information that came into his possession as leverage against parties in the local parliaments to make sure that they passed things that he wanted to get through. So this was very much a practical politician at work. And that for me is one of the mysteries about Jokowi working out at what point we suddenly get Jokowi the operator mm. prepared to take on, prepared to do things that are a little bit questionable to achieve an end. And at what point we suddenly get Jokowi is the person who is compliant. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I think we're all trying to work out about Jokowi at the moment. Mm. I mean, after having uh, piled onto him um, collectively over the past year, I mean, <laughs> can we see anything that's worth defending in this in this in this administration? Are there any are there any areas where he has actually used the political tools that are available him uh, available to him to um, sort of pursue something that he really cares about? Well, from economic front, I think uh, one of the th policies that has been applauded is the removal of the fuel subsidy um, just in the, what is it four five months uh, uh, he was in the office and I think that's a very good uh, uh, policy it it it, it is uh, it was unpopular but he he, he did it and of course uh, we we now want to see uh, the effect uh, uh, the safe money is now uh, according to the government is uh, given to infrastructure, which is, of course, is very needed for, for, uh, for development at the moment. But in the future, uh, we also want to see, you know, allocation, reallocation for education and health, for example. So, yeah, that's one of the policies that I think he, he, he uses, uh, common sense and, and good politics. Now, of course, you can't talk about uh, Jokowi's infrastructure drive without talking about the role of China in Indonesia's foreign relations and increasingly the economy. Is there a feeling that uh, Jokowi and the government understand the geopolitical consequences of, in some ways, quite publicly aligning themselves with Chinese economic power? Anybody? I'm not sure whether Jokowi understands the, geo <laughs> the geopolitics uh, of, of cozying up to China. Um, I think that, yes, we have seen um, Jokowi opened the doors to Chinese investment, certainly in the minerals and energy sector, they need investment. Mm. Um, there's been a big push to, to, uh, to develop the downstream industrialization of the resource sectors and China has been a huge player in that uh, and they need, they need that, that sort of investment. Uh, we've also seen uh, the, 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 a recent decision to choose a Chinese investor over a Japanese investor uh, for a big uh, rail infrastructure project in Indonesia. So we can see that, um, that the, the government is obviously prioritizing and is interested in Chinese investment. But then publicly, the media ha has been quite critical of, of some of these decisions. And we are beginning to see a bit of public debate about uh, whether uh, whether Indonesia should be uh, closing up in this way to China, but I, I don't know. I'm not sure I, I can I can speak to whether Jokowi himself or those in his executive um, are thinking in terms of, of the geopolitics of this. I don't know if Greg wants to comment on that. Well, one thing I'd say is that the Chinese have been very effective in cultivating Jokowi. President Xi went to Indonesia and spent three days there, which is a long time for the Chinese president to be there in April when Indonesia was marking the 60th anniversary of the Asia-Africa <coughs> summit. And so the Chinese have been investing a great deal of time in, in, uh, in persuading um, 
uh, Indonesian leaders or the merits of their various projects that they're putting forward. To my mind, this is one of the questions one has to ask about Jokowi. We'd previously thought that he was very development-minded and could be quite technocratic and rational. But in the case of the fast train project between Jakarta and Bandung that Eve mm. was referring to, this is a classic case in point. The, the Japanese got the contract to build the, the subway, the MRT, in Jakarta, or they're the main contractor. And there's a sense in Indonesia that these deals have to be shared around. But if you look at Japan's record in building high-speed high railways and China's record, <laughs> you would say there's really no argument. The Japanese have got a superb record of reliable investment in Indonesia, high engineering um, standards, everything they build works well. The Chinese have got a very checkered history in Indonesia. The power stations they built often never get more than 30 or 40 percent of their design capacity and the like because there are all sorts of problems with them. So by rights, if the government was doing this on the basis of merit, that project should have gone to the Japanese. And I think we've seen anger on the part of the Japanese government, which is unprecedented towards Indonesia and indeed towards any other country, I think, for a long, long time because they felt as if their claim was so much stronger than the Chinese. So clearly, Jokowi felt as if on this matter, some special treatment towards, some privileged treatment towards the Chinese would be a good thing. I think it's going to turn out to be a bad thing for Indonesia, I must say. Mm. I agree that uh, this railway uh, incident has hurt a uh, reputation of Indonesian international uh, forum and so I'm hoping that Jokowi can you know learn from it and especially now that uh, there is this new thing TPP also okay which China is not part of uh, but also on the other hand there is RCEP uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement uh, which China is uh, a part of so Indonesia should really be careful in in, in in dealing with this and because at the same time Indonesia is also uh, preparing itself for the AAC as an economic community. Right. So all these things uh, have has to be in the eye of uh, Jokowi also. Perhaps I should have mentioned that before. I mean, Luhut Panjaitan, this uh, very important minister, uh, and Jokowi himself have right. not uh, ruled out. Right. Uh, in fact, they've made uh, almost teasing comments about the possibility of Indonesia's joining the, the TPP. Right. Do you think that's a realistic um, scenario? It is probably, but in terms of time, uh, Indonesia has been investing on AEC and RCEP, so I think in terms of priority, they should really focus on these two uh, uh, former uh, negotiations, uh, which is actually, both of them are ending this uh, the negotiation this year, right? So um, TPP is, 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 is uh, next in the agenda because Indonesia is part of is not part of the TPP, but for AAC and uh, RCEP, of course, Indonesia is there. And RCEP is basically ASEAN plus six, right? So China, Korea, India, Australia, also New, Ze New Zealand are, are part of this. And I think Indonesia should pay attention uh, more towards what is going on in the region. Uh, but at the same time, of course, TPP is also important because it it's covers a lot of uh, uh, economy in the world and uh, the idea of s both TPP and RCEP actually to streamline all these conflicting uh, rules uh, uh, as a result of FTS, bilateral FTS, which is making some kind of spaghetti ball effect. So uh, it's a good thing if uh, Indonesia can maybe lead uh, in, in ASEAN for these uh, two initiatives. Uh, uh, AAC and RCEP. Hmm. I think it's fair to say that in Jokowi we see a president um, that is perhaps far less concerned with his own uh, image overseas and perhaps even with Indonesia's uh, image overseas compared to uh, President Yudhoyono. I mean, Australians will be familiar, familiar with the execution of two of our nationals in February this year, um, the current Hayes crisis um, that's uh, engulfing Southeast Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, like you said, some of these issues to do with uh, investment climate and perceived openness to foreign investment. How much do you think of this uh, so-called resurgence in nationalism that we're hearing about, particularly in the foreign media, um, can be sheeted home to Jokowi, uh, his own uh, example or perhaps a lack of leadership on his part? Or how much of this was just going to happen anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think that's an interesting question because if we look at some of the sort of policy manifestations of this kind of increased um, increased assertiveness in the, in the nationalist tone of politics in Indonesia, some of the, the more nationalist policies and nationalist rhetoric um, that we observe in the mineral mining sector were, were very much um, part of SBY's administration and his, and his last term. Um, so to an extent, you know, in my own research, I've been seeing this trend toward more assertive nationalism uh, for some time. But I think that we can see the presidential elections as almost a turning point um, in the kind of mainstreaming of this more aggressive nationalism. And uh, we, can, we can point partly to pro the kind of campaign that Prabowo uh, launched. Uh, it was very aggressive and it kind of painted this, this picture of Indonesia as a country that was um, regularly exploited and shamed uh, by its neighbours and, and by, by foreign investors. Um, and I think, that, I think that perhaps many political elites saw that um, as resonating with the Indonesian publics. Um, and perhaps that could explain to an extent why Jokowi has picked up on that and used that in ways that we hadn't expected uh, and why particular ministers have picked up on that and used that in ways that we wouldn't have expected. But I don't know, perhaps Greg wants to comment or Archie. Yeah, I, th I think I think it's true about Jokowi. I think the the world outside Indonesia for Jokowi is of interest to him, insofar as Indonesia can learn from other countries, and also make money out of them by um, exporting uh, Indonesian products or bringing in the kind of investment that allows him to achieve these very ambitious goals that he set for his infrastructure program also to a lesser extent for health and education. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned the executions, Liam, I think that's a very good example where one of the things that was said to him by a senior advisor was, if the economy was growing at 7%, um, part, part president, um, well then perhaps it wouldn't matter if you're executing all these people from foreign countries. But when the economy is actually doing poorly and is growing below, what, 5%, mm. well then actually you cannot afford to be alienating all these foreign countries. And that was packaged in a way that that person thought Jokowi would understand. The moment it hit Indonesia's ability to get what it wanted from the world outside, well then that became a concern to him. And I think he's actually an extraordinarily insular president in that regard with a very instrumental view of how he sees foreign relations anyway. And the, the narrowest agenda that we've seen of any president, um, I think, in Indonesian history. Uh, and so uh, we also see the markedly different messages he has for an international audience where he's trying to get investment and promote exports and the very nationalistic as, um, rhetoric he has when he's dealing with Indonesian audiences. We see, we from outside see a clear contradiction in this. It's another one of the mysteries for Jokowi, whether that is a contradiction in his own mind or all of these things can be rationalised. But I think um, it's going to be a problem for him because more and more people will see him as being inconsistent. Mm. Now, of course, one of the things um, that was a real stain on the legacy of the Yudhoyono government uh, was the deterioration in the uh, rights and security of religious minorities in Indonesia. Now, uh, Jokowi came to office known uh, for being not particularly uh, orthodox Muslim, um, and his party uh, that nominated him sees itself as the vanguard sort of uh, of Indonesian pluralism. So has that made a difference or are we still seeing that continued um, decline in religious pluralism in Indonesia? If we look at, it's a mixed picture. If we look at the statistics from the uh, NGOs that collect data on religious conflict, religious violence and harassment, the figures are better, better for the last year or so than what they've been through the final years of the SBY period. However, Jokowi himself can take, I think, very little credit for that. Mm. He has a religious affairs minister, Lukman Hakim Saifuddin, who has been the most progressive of any religious affairs minister going back probably at least 12 years. And um, he's not unalloyed in his promotion of religious tolerance. Um, he also picks his battles and at times um, makes strategic retreats. But overall, I think most people accept that he is trying to make Indonesia a more religiously tolerant place. 
In the case of Jokowi, there are almost no statements on the public record about religious tolerance. We do have responses to particular incidents of violence, such as the Tolikara case in, in Papua, and in fact state officials responded very well to that, and they were able to prevent that from spreading much more widely. We've had a somewhat similar response to the church burning in Aceh. Um, but overall, the disappointment with Jokowi is that he hasn't set a tone of tolerance himself. And we can look at this not just in religious field, but more broadly in political sphere. So in the last few weeks, we've had controversies over such things as the ability of the Shiite community in Indonesia to celebrate the Ashura festival, one of the main festivals on the religious calendar of Shia Muslims. Uh, there's been no statement from the government about that, which is very disappointing. Uh, also, we see the closing down of the public discourse, the public discussion about the mass killings in 1965. And both of these things are surprising because Jokowi's main political affiliation is with Megawati's PDIP, the, the Indonesian Democratic Party of Struggle. And that party has within its parliamentary representation a prominent Shia intellectual, and it also has several people who come from former communist families, families of victims of these killings. And so PDIP of all parties has a track record of defending not only secular rights, but also an open historical judgment of these critical events in Indonesian history. What we see under Jokowi is a narrowing, a closing down of all of that debate. And that, for me, was entirely unexpected. And that shows that Jokowi, to some extent, is captive of very conservative elements in the military. And uh, he's not giving any pushback to these very regressive moves that those people are seeking to undertake. Mm. On the other side of the ledger, though, um, for the, to an extent, Jokowi has a better sort of relationship or rapport with progressive elements of Indonesian civil society in the Indonesian political system. Um, his new chief of staff is the, one of the founders of a key anti-corruption NGO. Um, he has the ability to communicate with uh, sort of liberals in civil society and so on. Is there any kind of pattern to who he listens to and who he ignores? Because it seems like um, he gets advice from all corners, but like you said, listens to the conservatives. D does that reflect a, just a fundamental conservative ideological outlook on his part? Well, I'll just quickly answer a little bit of that. My view is that one thing, he's turning out to be far more intellectually narrow president than what I had previously imagined. In fact, he cares about a relatively small range of things. And some of the rhetoric during the camp presidential election campaign, indeed, as Guitar Jakarta governor, in fact, I now suspect was scripted for him. And he himself had very little input to that. So these issues of religious tolerance, of human rights, of continuing political reform, I think he regards those as expendable. They are second or third order matters. What most matters for him is development, is economic growth, particularly dealing with the, the poorer people of Indonesia. And that's all very virtuous. I'm not criticizing that. But I wish that he had a broader vision of what his presidency could be, and that's what he lacks. So he does have these progressive people around him, but you rarely hear him investing in those progressive views in public, and I don't feel, think he feels at all confident in doing so. Mm. Indeed, I mean, it, it seems like if you can actually um, frame a reactionary political agenda in the kind of language of development and uh, economics that appeals to him, you can get him to do some remarkable things. For instance, a recent, this recent decree that he signed that protects local officials from prosecution uh, for corruption. Um, has he bought into this idea that actually the anti-corruption effort is getting in the way of so-called development? Um, yes. <laughs> but I th and this is again one of the most surprising, I think, uh, developments over the past mm. year is that Jokowi, the president who was very much supported by um, anti-corruption activists, um, reform activists, um, and so we all expected him 
um, I guess, to, to implement and to pursue those sorts of reforms. Um, and what was surprising is how quickly he, he abandoned the, the anti-corruption drive. Um, and there are many reasons, I think, why he did that. Uh, but it, it demonstrates, I think, um, a fickleness in the way he approaches uh, policy and the way he approaches people. And um, what's surprising is that it's under Jokowi's watch, not under a previous president, um, that we've seen uh, the attack on anti-corruption, on the anti uh, on the corruption eradication commission. He enabled the criminalisation of their directors. Uh, he's enabling the parliament to attack the law um, on anti-corruption in the uh, in the parliament, and he's also. Um, as you said, Liam, he's now kind of singing the song of, of the old elites um, in terms of anti-corruption being a hindrance to efficiency and to development and that these anti-corruption activists really, uh, get, get in the way of, of, of the business of government. Um, and I think that's really dangerous, in fact. Yeah. What do you think? I think that also applies to economic front. I mean, yeah. uh, we, we have said about contradiction and it's... Uh, at the end of the day, it's all a matter of who has Jokowi's ears, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we, we we see very contradictory uh, signals for for if he uh, talks about agriculture, for example, and then investment, mm -hmm. because uh, different ministers have different views and even contradictory at times. So it's unfortunate that uh, it all matters of uh, who gets his ears because he himself seems to be lacking the narratives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that someone who has his ear, and that brings up another little detail of his presidency. He's not known for being a reader, is he? <laughs> he doesn't seem to like it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, another one of these um, actors who has sort of clogged their own agenda in the language of uh, national development uh, is the military. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's been quite a bit of speculation um, about how serious... Uh, the military's efforts to sort of uh, sneak its way back into areas of civilian governance um, have been under the Jokowi presidency. Um, do you think um, that uh, it's too early to be alarmed or is, is something really significant going on here? Uh, it looks like it could be developing a kind of momentum that would make one concerned. Uh, because we have a consistent pattern of senior military and defence officials, including the defence minister, coming out and making statements that, uh, and indeed taking the initial steps to put in place programs that would greatly expand the role of the military within society. And much uh, when the so-called reformasi process began in 1998 after Sahata was forced from office, one of the key targets of the reformers was the military. They wanted the military as much as possible back in the barracks. And what we've seen under Jokowi to an extent that, again, was a very one of the really surprising things about his presidency is how he either didn't care or indeed was happy to go along with the military coming back out of the barracks and being involved in village development, distributing food, building bridges and roads, um, engaging in ideological campaigns on campuses, taking a much bigger role in counter-terrorism, even providing staff for prisons. So there are a whole range of things that have been proposed and some new quite extensive moves that are now underway, such as having, in effect, a civilian defence force that might be as many as 100 million people and everyone under the age of 50 is obliged to be involved. There's been not that broader range of opposition to that at the moment, but we just see in the next year, when people consider the cost of this, when they when ordinary citizens start working out how disruptive this might be and indeed whether it's at all necessary under current circumstances in which Indonesia really doesn't face a, a legitimate threat anywhere in the region, whether this is all worthwhile or is this a military, self-interested military pushing these programs, I'm hoping that it's the latter, that, that people begin to push back against this and that um, the efforts of the, of the current TNI, the current armed forces head, and the current defence minister um, will end up facing serious resistance. But at the moment, you'd have to say they have wind in their sails. Mm. Uh, now, uh, just one last question. I, I, I know it seems a bit silly to um, speculate about the 2019 election so far out, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> um, 
There have been several polls that have come out uh, in the last week or so uh, in conjunction with the one year anniversary of Jokowi's inauguration. Um, they've actually started measuring um, the electability of uh, candidates for the election uh, in four years time. Prabowo Subianto looks mm -hmm. like he's still very much a contender. Where is Prabowo now? What's he doing? And what is his agenda for the next four years? <laughs> <laughs> I would just say he might try again and he will fail again. You're confident that Jokowi will be re-elected? Um, I'm not saying that, but I, I'm <laughs> saying that Prabowo will not become the president. <laughs> Any speculation? I wouldn't rule out um, him throwing his, the hat in the ring again. <laughs> I think that um, we all know how ambitious he is and, and how badly he wanted the presidency. And even though he's been laying low for the past year, um, I don't see any reason, in fact, but barring his health, maybe, uh, why he wouldn't run again. Um, and I mean, I'm not sure how much we should read into those polls. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's quite natural that, you know, when people are really displeased with the current president, that they might mm -hmm. look to uh, what the alternative might have been and say that that would be better right now. If the, if the election was held tomorrow, that would be better. Um, but I, I think that, that Prabowo will certainly, um, right. yeah, consider <laughs> running again in 2019. And Prabowo has played an interesting game because mm -hmm. during the election, presidential election, he was so emphatic in his opposition to everything that Jokowi said in everything that Jokowi represented. And, you know, we saw his challenge to the election result itself. So I think a lot of us had the expectation that he would be a very implacable opposition leader. And in fact, he's proved to be anything but. <laughs> and at times he's been quite willing to cooperate with Jokowi to allow Jokowi to achieve, at, at, at times of considerable political pressure for Jokowi, Prabowo has helped him out. And he might be doing this for a number of reasons. One is that by occasionally accepting Jokowi's phone calls and invitations, he keeps himself in the political mix, as it were. Jokowi is consulting him and he's able to increase his own influence. Um, but also there's a lot of reporting that some of his companies aren't doing very well. And there is also speculation that some of those companies have been helped out by the government, given contracts. And so... Um, if that's the case, well, then there is a then there is a material interest that mm. Prabowo has from helping Jokowi. So I'm also fully expecting he will be a presidential candidate in 2019. But relations between the two men hasn't been as or haven't been as arctic as I was expecting them to be. Mm. And I, I do I know I said that was the last mm -hmm. question, but I suppose we should just address this one remaining sort of puzzle, I guess, about the Jokowi presidency. And is that is how easy the opposition in Parliament has been uh, on the administration. Um, are we seeing this as sort of proof of the, the, the theory that really um, the cost of stability in Indonesian politics um, is basically putting a reform agenda on ice? What do you think? I don't know. Why, why have they been so docile? And why do they go so docile so quickly? I think, I think you're exactly right. If the government had not been going to such effort to accommodate a large number of vested interests, well then we wouldn't see this level of cooperativeness from, from the parliament. And the fact that, uh, you know, Eve mentioned before about the, the Corruption Eradication Commission and, uh, and, and most people in Parliament have been gunning for that commission for many years because it has cut down many of their colleagues who indeed were vastly corrupt mm. and they had it coming to them. Uh, but they want very much to neuter the KPK and uh, Jokowi is, he vacillates on the issue is, is my reading of it. But I think they must feel as if they're going, they may well get quite a few of the things that they want and we're probably going to have a far less effective leadership of the KPK than we've had in the previous term. This group of commissioners have been criminalised, facing prosecution. So uh, that's one example of the kind of thing that Jokowi is doing, which in fact keeps parliamentarians happy. Mm. Well, as usual, I guess it looks like there's a trade-off between uh, reform and uh, cordial relations between different elites. Um, guys, thanks very much for coming in today. Appreciate you making the time.